Okay, we're back at it. Um, we got Donnie Vincent in town. <laughs> thanks for coming in. Yeah, thanks for having me. I had, uh, unexpected when I get a message from guys like you to sit down and have oh, a chat. You please. never know really where the work goes. Everyone under the sun is probably is probably messaging <laughs> you. Unbelievable um, for those watching. Um, huge fan of Donnie's. Um, hunter, biologist, father, um, teacher, your artist, you're all the things. I'm, I'm a little bit of all of that, yeah. <laughs> a little bit of all of that, yeah. I remember watching, for anyone that, uh, Google Donnie Vincent, and then uh, what's, a, what's the seven minute, uh, who we are? Who we are, yeah. That was like the first, my first thing that I saw of yours, and I was like, this is completely different than anything in the hunting space. By far. Yeah, it was... Uh, and kind of everything you've done, kind of your, probably your whole career has been different than the traditional hunting space does. 100%. It's, uh, who we are was, uh, wasn't even supposed to be seen publicly. Oh, we, really? we made that privately for National Geographic because they wanted to do a TV show with us, with my crew, and, and uh, they were pitching ideas to us that we didn't like. And, and um, so I pitched an idea to them, mm -hmm. or rather our crew pitched an idea where I would go and live with different tribes that still hunt and fish and forage for a living. So I would go and live with them in um, all Alaska, over the world. All over the world, okay. And, um, and just kind of experience their culture. And so, uh, but they were basically against hunting. And so they asked me, they said, hey. National Geographic? National was? Geographic. And they gotcha. said, unapologetically, please just kind of build us a piece and teach us why you hunt. Tell us why it is that you hunt so that we can try to understand it. We'll bring it to our board. Sure. We'll let them watch it. And it, they said, you know, it doesn't have to be cinematic, just do it. And so that's what it was. And we, um, uh, you know, we made that. And then uh, Kyle Nicolite, who's uh, the director and producer that works at Sigmanta, he, he said, hey, I think we should make this public. And I said, absolutely not. I, you know, I talk about PETA in there and, and veganism and vegetarian I said we're not we're not releasing I don't I'm not looking for a fight and then he just kept bugging me and I said finally I said fine release it yeah. so he did and it was I mean a massive response I got so many um I got so many letters from anti-hunters and non-hunters and people that but al almost people. almost all of it was positive response yeah I'm trying to see how many views have been on it I mean I'm sure it's absurd I think, I th I think it's I think it's uh, in all the different places. I think it might be millions, but I'm sure it's millions. Yeah. I mean, I've watched it. So that, times. so that, that's why we made that was to. Um, I didn't get in an argument with with National Geographic, but I was kind of, kind of pulling their, kind of calling their because they they show hunting on some of their channels and things yeah. like that, but it's always wrapped around native cultures and and um, you know that's kind of what they hang their hat on. So did you grow up hunting? I grew up, that's all I thought about when I was growing up, but I don't come from a hunting family. My father, uh, you know, he kind of, he owned some guns, and, but what really inspired me beyond words, uh, he had a, quite a book collection, and, you know, he had books on, and I didn't, I didn't fully understand this growing up, but then I- Where did you grow up at? Connecticut. Oh, really? But then I realized my, my grandparents gifted him all of these books when he was a boy. So there are things on wilderness survival and wilderness cooking and hunting, fishing. And, and, uh, and I just would read these books when I was a kid. But this is literally all I've ever wanted to do. Really? It's a fascination with wildlife and then turned into a, you know, I didn't realize why I wanted to hunt when I was a kid. I just wanted to hunt, wanted to go places, wanted to uh, have a weapon in my hands, wanted to take an animal's life and at first it was kind of you know me versus the wilderness like I wanted to be strong and fit and I didn't want to be afraid of bears and I wanted to shoot big rifles and then I went on my first hunt my first big game hunt for black bears in Alaska and as soon as I had my first real encounter with a bear how old were you probably in my early 20s and um, when I saw that bear I realized how much I didn't want to shoot it yeah and just watched him move and and I was sitting on a beach and there there were herring gulls squawking and and um, and the the tide was coming in and salmon were were running up this little stream and I was sitting on a log and I saw that black shape kind of materialize mm -hmm. from the forest you know mm -hmm. and 
And then I started looking at him rather than just looking and saying, hey, there's a bear. I'm going to raise my rifle, put my crosshairs and kill it. Yeah. I started watching the bear. You know, I was sort of looking at his body, yeah. his nose, his toes, and watching him kind of be a bear. And, and, uh, and I didn't shoot him. Mm -hmm. And then that night I was living on a... Uh, I was living on a fishing boat that was converted to kind of like sleeping quarters. And uh, the captain of the boat, he just ran me out. We were in the Prince William Sound. And uh, he ran me out uh, for probably 10 days. And so that night, he and I were having dinner. And he asked me, he said, did you see any bears tonight? I said, yeah, I saw a big one. And he said, oh, how come you didn't shoot? You know, and I just said, yeah, I don't think I'm going to shoot a bear. And, um, and he and he started asking me why, and I just said, I don't know, I just started watching his, his eyes, and I could see him, you know, bears, they kind of articulate the end of their nose when they're smelling things, and I could see that the bear saw me as well. I could just, you know, we had a moment, if you will, and, yeah. and um, the, the closer I looked at the bear, the less I wanted to hunt him or shoot him. Mm -hmm. And so I was telling this to Ron, his name's Ron Johnson on the boat, and he, he, he just said, hey man, like, I think you're more of a hunter than you realize. The things that you're saying to me yeah. is what makes a hunter. Yeah. And uh, he, he's like, your appreciation, understanding, and, and kind of um, being enamored with that bear is part of you entering into predator and prey, mm -hmm. part of you entering into the ecosystem, and part of you, you know, we have to kind of remove ourselves from being human and, and kind of enter into the, the ecosystem and become part of it. And so. Yeah, you, I mean, because, I mean, you, 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 way you, I mean, you talk a lot about, like, you know, the responsibility of killing an animal mm -hmm. and being out there. I mean, and you go out there for two, three months at a time, and, like, you were in, in that space. Yeah. And I don't, there's not a lot of people out there that hunt. Like, most people think they just go hunting, you know, pull the trigger, and that's it. Yeah. And there's a lot more to it than just that. Yeah. If, if you're present and you're aware of what you're doing, where you're going, and why it is that you're doing it, it's way more. Mm -hmm. It's way more. It's more than just, obviously, there's camaraderie that comes along with it. You go with friends, you go with family, you know, you spend time with your parents or buddies, brothers, sisters, whatever. But it's, um, you know, taking an animal's life is a, is a big step. And then eating, you know, skinning that animal, breaking mm -hmm. it down, carrying it out, eating that animal, it means a really rewarding aspect of being alive and living. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, and you, I mean, in the who we are thing, like you, you, I mean, you talk about like we all come from that type of life. At, at we human. Not only do we come from hunters, not yeah. only do we come from warriors, but human beings. That's how we've evolved. That's how our brains became so big. That's how we became so. Um, adaptable and and uh and having understanding as we foraged for meat we scavenged for meat and mm -hmm. then we hunted for meat and then we cooked meat mm -hmm. and in doing so we gave ourselves an evolutionary catalyst to becoming human beings yeah yeah i mean it's literally who we are it defines what it is to be a human being without a doubt we're a great ape and we are the most advanced great ape in the in the process of having opposable thumbs and a big mm -hmm. brain mm -hmm. yeah I mean, we live in a world like where I feel like the hunters, like a lot of hunters are, I mean, looked down upon because of, you know, shooting and killing yeah. animals and stuff. Yeah. And it's just, that's not really the, we wouldn't be here if that wasn't the case. That's true. Yeah. And, and you look at any population of people, right? You can, you know, um, there, there are stereotypes that people kind of, you know, they want to categorize people in and, and hunters, unfortunately, have you know, slip down into to having this. But a, a lot of other cultures that you go to, the hunters are revered, right? They're, mm -hmm. they're, the, they're the, um, the village elders. They're the, you know, the, like if um, I spent time in several different Eskimo villages and they're always really quick and I'm not necessarily there um, hunting. I, I've spent a lot of time in villages doing research and, and uh, they're qu always quick to point out who the best hunters are in the village. Oh, really? Yeah, always really quick to point out like, yeah, that's, uh, that's Joseph. He, he, man, he gets a moose every year. Really? He gets a moose every year. He's a really good fisherman. He gets his moose every year. You know, they're always, <laughs> and uh, you know, I did some work in Bangladesh and, and there's no hunting in Bangladesh. Um, I was there studying tigers, but, um, the gentleman that I was working for, Dr. Dave Smith, he, he, uh, you know, he said, Hey, 
if, if, if they bring up hunting, you know, you can tell them about hunting, but um, just understand that these people here, they're not hunters. They're the biologists that you're working with, they're, they're not against hunting, but they battle poachers all the time with tigers and spotted deer. And, and uh, I said, yeah, I understand that. And then in talking to them, you know, they, they said, hey, you know, we don't hunt and we don't condone hunting here because our, our populations need to be uh, worked on before we can actively hunt them. But they said all of our ancestors uh, so were the they best were hunters. They, they do eat meat, yep, Cat, like cattle and chickens, on, goats. Chickens, goats, goats yep. stuff like that, yep. got it. What were, you do, what were you studying tigers? What were, what were you doing? Um, in Bangladesh, I did a project in Bangladesh and a project in Nepal. Uh, the one in Bangladesh, we're uh, in the Sundarbans. It's the world's largest mangrove swamp. Mm -hmm. uh, sits on the Bay of Bengal, and we were basically driving what looks like a gondola. We had a, we had a mothership that we would travel on to big systems, and then we would get on these little gondolas, and we'd go up and down millions of miles of, of canals looking for tigers uh, or tiger tracks called a pog mark. And so we're basically every time we would see a tiger or a track, that's an event. And so we're trying to map out where the tigers are in the Sunderbonds and how they're using it and then trying to come up with some um, level of population. Incredible. It was. How long were you there? I w uh, just a couple of months there and then I was a couple of months in Nepal. Yeah, and I wish I wish I could experience that now because it was when I was fresh out of college and, and where'd you go um, to college? University of Minnesota, and so I just um, I don't know I just would appreciate it so much more now. But it's a dangerous it's a really dangerous place. I'm sure. Yeah, Bangladesh is really dangerous. Lots of. Uh, so what did you study in school? Wildlife biology and and then uh, just scientific biology. Were yeah. you hunting in college then too? Oh yeah, yeah. I was I was I mean I wasn't literally going to Alaska every year um, still. And I'd really? travel up to the Arctic Circle and go hunt caribou. And, and uh, yeah, I remember I wasn't. How did you get, I mean, going to Alaska and Arctic Circle, I mean, that's a huge event. Like, how did you, how did you figure that out and, and get hooked up there? I wanted at to. Such, at such a young age. I wanted to see caribou migrate. So I just started looking at where the herds were and then where I could fly and kind of um, get to and so I, I, I would fly into Anchorage and I'd fly from Anchorage to Kotzebue Which is way up on the based on the Chukchi Sea way up in the Arctic. Were you doing um, this in the summers? No, nope, in the fall in, in the September in, in while you're in school. Yep So I would take a couple of weeks off and I go talk to all my professors and they're say like, hey, hey I'm I, going to I have do to this. go do this. Yeah a couple of times I <laughs> <laughs> a couple of times I would lie a couple of times I would say hey family emergency or yeah, gotta go gotta go. Yeah. Yep and then I'd come home and I would just buckle down. And I mean, I, I remember packing for a trip by candlelight because I hadn't paid my electricity, mm -hmm. hadn't paid my water. Yeah. But I was going to Alaska, going to, Alaska. to hunt caribou. Mm -hmm. yep. With a gun? With a gun back then, yep. yeah. Yeah, because when I was younger, I wanted to be a rifleman, right? That's what I, that's, everything was about being a marksman, uh, learning guns, learning calibers. I was reading every book that I could. and. And, uh, and I still, I love rifles, I love shooting them, but, uh, but once I started shooting a bow, and the, the quiet, mm -hmm. and how close you have to get, and mm -hmm. the fact that you have to lay, you know, face down in the, in the dirt for a long time to get close to an animal, and you, that, that engagement that I had in the beginning watching the black bear, yeah. um, me not shooting that bear, but watching him come, because he walked, you know, he walked past me at 10 yards, mm -hmm. and he fed on salmon at 10 yards, so watching him, archery hunting kind of brings you that right if you have a rifle it's very easy to lay that not easy but to lay that rifle on a log or backpack get on the bear squeeze the trigger you're successful yeah. with a bow I have to crawl amongst those logs and get closer and closer and in doing that I open myself up to that experience of watching him really close and getting mm -hmm. really close and then also you're unsuccessful a lot which kind of gives you that you get to keep working on your craft and and uh, you know makes you not to alienate women, but it makes you feel like a man, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, and then now I'm shooting a traditional bow, which is, it's, it's just it's super rewarding watching that arrow flight. And I mean, you gotta, I mean, you gotta be within 20 yards, right? 30 yards. With, uh, with, that, a, with, with a trad? With, with, yeah. Yeah, I mean, within, um, for me right now, the, the way I'm shooting and I'm working on my skull all the time, probably 30 yards, 35 yards, I'm relatively comfortable with. But uh, you have to be close. 
really close. 20 yards, 25 yards, that's a slam dunk for me with a, with a trad ball. Yeah. And how fast are those things going? That's a uh, great question. Because, I mean, like, the compound bows, I mean, you're 350, yeah, 300 feet yeah, per second. Yeah, these things are, that's a really good question, and it's probably 200? around. 200? No, 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 it's like probably around 200 yeah. feet per second. I don't, I don't know, but I'm shooting a pretty big heavy arrow, and, yeah. and my bow is 50 pounds, and I'm pulling. So it does a trick. Yeah. You just got to be tight. Oh, it'll do the trick. Yeah. Like, it'll, because it, you know, every, every, you know, physics, every action has an opposite and equal reaction. So even though my arrow's going slow, mm -hmm. it's tipped with a, with a scalpel. Yeah. And so when an arrow is going really, uh, when a light arrow is going really fast, when it hits the animal, it meets a lot of resistance, right? Because it's traveling really fast and it doesn't have a lot of momentum to go through the animal. My arrow is traveling slow, so it, it has much less resistance plus it's a, a scalpel it's gonna go it's gonna blow right through yeah everything outside of a hippo or an elephant rhino is gonna blow right through have you done have you hunted in africa no nope. i've been invited about 50 60 times that i've never been don't want to australia is the only um i was invited a bunch to australia too i have a this guy would write me his name's nick joyce he'd write me i showed you a photo of him last mm -hmm. night He'd write me all the time, hey, mate, I want you to come to Australia, and I would just kind of blow it off. i get invited to go a lot of places. Uh -huh. and, uh, and so finally, he kept bugging me, and I said, all right, Nick, you tell me what you think. They're, they have these animals that are uh, called Asiatic water buffaloes. They're, they're introduced to, uh, to Australia from Asia for, uh, for food, and then they've just kind of like taken over the country sure. in Northern Territory. So finally, I reached back to him, and I said, Nick, you, you tell me about the buffalo. Because I wanted to see if he was going to say, oh, mate, they're big, dumb animals. You know, we need to kill as many as possible. But sure. he didn't. He said, hey, he's like, mate, these things are amazing. They're fascinating. He's like, I know they get talked down about yeah. being big, dumb animals. But he's like, they're anything but. They're very cunning, um, how they move around their space. He's like, they're very tough. They kill people every year. They're, you know, really, um, uh, really steadfast animal. They defend themselves mm -hmm. um, with absolute force. And so... His answer, I was like, yeah, I'm coming. Yeah. And so we went up there and we lived in the bush. You know, we, we would travel. I flew to Sydney, from Sydney to Darwin. From Darwin, I got in his Hilux, Toyota Hilux. We drove six hours on pavement, Shit. then six hours on dirt. Then we hit the jungle and drove another six or seven hours through the jungle. We had to cut trees down. We had to go through, you know, we had to winch across rivers and, uh, and I look at Nick and I say, yeah, is there a lot of buffalo here? He's like, I don't know, I've never been here. <laughs> you know, and, and so we just kind of explored and, and we ended up finding buffalo and we ended up arrowing a, a really big buffalo that was, you know, we were kind of in a dangerous situation, but it was, it was incredible. Like watching my arrow just, he was 35 yards and he was, I'm not going to tell you he was coming to charge, but he was coming. They lower their head down and they kind of like touch their knee when they're, feeling aggressive and that's what he was doing you know he's kind of lowering shoulder coming to us and and I was kind of now or never and and Nick showed me this little triangle that's perfect on them to, and I came to full draw and it's when we come out when the film comes out it's going to be sick because I had a guy filming right down my arrow shaft and then another photographer and basically like I had to kill the bull or like if I messed it up we we're going to be in big trouble really I, we didn't have a gun and yeah. there the nearest tree was probably two miles away and so I just came to full draw, and he was just stepping, and I just found my spot and just, boom, arrow away. And, and um, you know, was, I don't know how much they weigh, 3,000 pounds, but my arrow buried to the knock. He whirled around, and he ran probably uh, 20 yards and fell over dead in probably less than 10 seconds. Really? Yeah, maybe 8 seconds, 5 seconds. And then what the hell do you do with the thing? Well, um you you're you're basically if i'm being honest you basically just kill them sure. you're basically just killing them gotcha. right we have no way to preserve meat they're mm -hmm. as, according to australia they'd want you to kill them all right yeah. they use them they they shoot them from helicopters they're trying to but so they're like hogs in the south here yeah like essentially just, just get rid but, of them. but what we did um i can't do that yeah. so i you know so we went over there and uh we broke it down mm -hmm. um and we had been seeing a lot of uh, families of dingoes. In fact, we filmed a piece that is, um, we filmed dingoes pack hunting buffalo, which uh, nobody had ever seen before. Mm -hmm. And like the dingo consulate called us after we released that footage and and uh, they, they use it in documentaries over there. And, oh, and they're really? just like, yeah, they had no idea that dingoes pack hunted buffalo. And we filmed it all one morning. And it was uh, so haunting. But so we broke the animal down for the dingoes because they can't, 
the, yeah. the hide is an inch and a half, they can't yep. get through it. So we broke it all down and laid it all out for these dingo families to come and feed. And then we took, you know, we took probably 20 pounds of it and then we yeah. ate it over the next yeah. two weeks, which was really kind of interesting because it was 100 degrees every day and we had no way to keep the meat, but we just hung it in the shade and then every day we'd cut off of it and eat it. Was it good? Yeah, it's fantastic. Each piece had really good flavor. And the bull that I killed, was, he was 15 years old. Um, every piece had tremendous flavor. Some of it you could chew and swallow. Uh -huh. Some of it you just kept chewing and then eventually you just had to like Spread pull it out of your mouth and throw it in the bush. Yeah, because it was just, just some pieces were just too tough. Pop quiz, how safe is your internet browsing? I bet you don't know, do you? You might not even be thinking about it, but you know who is? Hackers, advertisers, data companies. There are a lot of people who know what you're doing online. So let me help you out by hooking you up with my friends at IP Vanish. IP Vanish is a VPN, a virtual private network. You may or may not know what it is, but a VPN basically makes you invisible to all those prying eyes on the web. You just connect to IP Vanish and then go browse wherever you want. And IP Vanish encrypts your data to make sure your info, like passwords and private details, remain yours. You can use IP Vanish on unlimited devices without sacrificing on speed, your computers, tablets, phones, even devices like your Fire Stick when you're streaming media. Whether I'm at home or in public, I don't go online anymore without using. IP Vanish. And right now they're offering an incredible 70% off their yearly plan for our listeners with a 30 day money back guarantee. That's just like getting nine months for free. Stop sharing your digital info with the world. Take your privacy back today with a brand rated 4.6 out of 5 on Trustpilot. So go to IPVanish.com slash Cutler and use promotional code Cutler and claim your 70% savings. That's IPVanish.com slash Cutler. Cutler. What's your favorite meat? Either black bear or Stop it. either black bear or Stop mountain lion. It. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> yeah. What was the other one? Mountain lion. What, what is, first of all, both of those options are awful. Why would, oh, you, cho why would you choose either one of them? Have you had black bear or mountain lion, Travis? Okay. Anyway, <laughs> Pete, we're going to listen to this. It's, they're, they're amazing. They're incredible. They, <laughs> Okay, so you're you're gonna have to walk me through this. When one. we, so I I was in British Columbia hunting bears one time, and I was with some buddies of mine, and uh, I said, hey, when we arrow a bear, we're eating it, and they said, man, like these the bears these days bears stink. You don't have to take the bear meat in the spring; you can leave it. Really? So yeah, so legally you can just kill the bear, take the hide, leave the meat, and another bear will eat it. The sure. meat. Yeah, but uh, bears eat anything. I'm not doing that. So I told them, okay. I said, we're taking all the meat and we're going to eat it. And they said, nah, mate, like the, the, the fat is, is, it stinks. They have worms. They, you know, they have trichinosis. We're not, we're not doing this. Yeah, I said, oh, all the things. I said, oh, we're doing it. We're doing it. And so, so we kill this bear. We break it down. He's a big bear, an old bear, probably seven foot black bear, 400 pounds. And, uh, so we take it back to the cabin. We're, we're tenting, we're living on a boat, but mm -hmm. now that we're successful, we're going back to the cabin. Yeah. And, uh, and we cooked it up and- uh, How'd you cook it? So, okay, so we, we cut it down into chunks, cut. cleaned the fat off of it, and then we basically put a crust on it of seasoning, seared it in oil and butter, cut. and then put it in a crock pot with bone broth for eight hours. So Travis, if you don't cook, Bear meat long enough, it could it can it can kill you. You'll get you'll get trichinosis. Yes. Yeah, you're gonna. It's not. I mean, it, it can get bad real fast. You'll get worms. Yes, yeah, you get worms. Yeah, <laughs> and um, it was amazing, and so it was really good. Really, I mean, and we ate the whole bear. It's like a roast. It's like a you know. A, yeah, a, it's just how you know if if you were to cut a steak off a bear, put no seasoning on it, throw it in a pan, it, you know it's. It's probably still going to be really good, but it's it's um it's not going to be as good as if you take the time to prepare it. But we take the time to prepare it, and the same thing with a lion. I, I busted mean, I, these I, guys. I've had bear. Like my dad likes eating bear, and I I mean I just can't get over the fact that I mean they they'll eat damn near anything. Anything. And I we guts. We ate a bear one time. Whatever. I was arguing with a guy about this. Yeah. And. Uh, I mean, if you're going to eat a bear, like I mean, what stops you from eating like a coyote? It's a, it's the same. Oh, I eat a coyote. Stop it. <laughs> hey, man, you don't want to be in an airplane crash with me and not make it because I'll eat your ass. I mean, I'll eat. I mean, yes. I mean, be like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to 
do it just because. Like, if we're out there and, like, I mean, we're up against it, sure, I'll eat whatever we got, whatever <laughs> oh, it takes. If we, if we are camping, yes. even if we had food, if we were camping and we killed a coyote and we scun it out, broke it down, and I cooked it, guaranteed you'd eat it. Guaranteed I would not eat it. Absolutely you would. And you'd probably be looking at me like everyone else and saying, not a no, I've never eaten a coyote. I've never eaten a coyote. But everything else that I've eaten where guys were like, oh, you can't. Same with same when I killed that lion. Those, I've heard I've heard mountain lion is actually good. Oh, it is unbelievable. Really? It's unbelievable. It's white meat and it tastes exactly it tastes like pork except for with tons of flavor. And not gamey flavor. Just tons of flavor. I mean I'll I'll I don't know if I'll try. I mean, we we cooked lion. Lions have trichinosis too, but we cooked Oh they do? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We well, cooked, I mean of course they do. They yeah. eat, they eat Pred- whatever. Predator, yeah. Yeah. So we killed this lion, cooked him, and I asked the guides, the houndsmen and the other guys, I said, have you guys ever eaten a lion? Oh, yeah, yeah, we've eaten it. It's not, it's terrible. It's terrible. You can't eat it. It's terrible. I said, well, let, let me tell you something. If we kill a lion on this trip, we're eating it. And they, oh, no, yeah, absolutely not. We're not. And I said, but you've all eaten it. I caught him in a bald-faced lie. They said, yes, we've all eaten it. I said, okay. We went, killed the lion, broke it down. Big lion. Big lion. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Broke it down. And they were just standing next to me like, oh, I can, I, the thing already stinks. I skin it out, break it down. We're hanging the meat. I cu- cut a bunch. We take the back straps, the inner loins, and a whole hind quarter into the cabin. Mm-hmm. We're going to cook it for dinner. Mm-hmm. The back straps and the inner loin, we salt and pepper and put it on the grill and basically like make little medallions. Mm-hmm. They don't even make it to the kitchen table. Okay, all these got all of these guys that have eaten lion yeah. and say it's disgusting, didn't even let it get to the kitchen table. It was gone. Just crushed it. Yeah. Then we just did a roast exactly like we did the black bear sure. roast, and um, which was funny because we did a sheep roast, mm-hmm. which sheep is really good eating. Yeah. We did I a sheep, sheep roast, and we did a lion roast. And at the end of the night, the sheep, some of the sheep roast was still left, and the lion yeah, roast was long gone. gone. Yeah. And it, we had kind of that, you know, that awkwardness when you have one piece of pizza left and mm-hmm. everyone's still a little hungry. Uh-huh. We had that happening with the lion roast. There was still a little bit of sheep roast, but guys would sit up with the, you know, like the slotted spoon. Like they'd go through the like gravy, like, oh, there's uh-huh. no more lion. And they, so then these, all of these guys, uh-huh. there's the three of them, I shouldn't say all these guys. But one of the guys was heading home to his family because we were done with the hunt. And, um, and he said, hey, like, do you mind if I take the rest of your lion home to my family? And this is a guy that was, you know, a week ago was telling me it was unedible. Yeah. And so we packaged it all up. Um, vacuum packed it for him, broke it all down, and then he mm-hmm. took it home to his family. And he, this guy lives in the bush, so. I mean, of all the animals you've, I mean, caribou, moose, moose elk, is fantastic. I've never, elk's fantastic. Elk's, oh, elk's my favorite. Yeah. Um, I'm going to my first uh, moose hunt uh, this fall in Maine. In where? Maine. I am as well. Really? Yeah. I hunted Maine last year, and I'm going back again this year. You're going, yeah, this is my first year to go this year. Hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah. I'm excited. Never never killed a moose. What, um, are you there in the first season? Yes. First week of October? Yes. Yeah, same. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know where you're going? No. It's on my phone. <laughs> somewhere. Somewhere, yeah. somewhere northern Maine. Mm. I've never been to Maine. Oh, it's amazing. So yeah. I've heard. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, we used to travel up there when I was kids. We used to go up there fly fishing. A bunch of, I, I mean, I've heard there's a bunch of moose up there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we saw... I killed one last year. Um, I think I killed, uh, we hunted and I think we killed like the fourth or fifth oldest moose in Maine last year. Really? Of the bulls that were killed, yeah. I think our bull was 11 and a half, something like that. How, long, how old did they live? About that, I mean, you know, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, something like Cows will live a little bit longer, but bulls, you know, because they fight so much, uh-huh. they'll probably live, you know, 12, 13. What do you do with all that meat? Give Eat it. Away? Eat I'm it? almost out. Oh, really? Well, you know, I shared it with the sure. crew. Yeah. yeah, but like I'm... Take it I, back as much as you can? Yeah, in fact, I just text uh, William Altman, our director of photography. I said, hey, how are you doing on moose meat? Because, you know, like I might have you... Because he lives in Maine. Uh-huh. So I'm, I told him I might have him ship a box to me because I'm almost out of mine. Yeah. Yeah, I can't wait. But when I when when, when we killed it, mm-hmm. it's a massive bull. We broke it down and then um, I had to go... We were going to do some waterfall hunting. So we broke it down to quarters and, and then... Uh, dropped it off at a local butcher and he's he's like i'll get it all butchered up donnie and, and package for you and i was like great and um that's a lot of meat oh i went back to his place 
and I walk into the back of his shed and he has these massive upright freezers. So I see one with my name on it and uh, I open the door, left to right, up and down, back to front. You could not put another package of meat. I mean, literally, it was a wall of meat in the exact shape of the freezer. Mm -hmm. And I opened the door and I looked back at him and I said, hey, which of this is me? And he's like, oh, all of it. All of it. Uh, it was like 650 pounds. Really? Yeah. Yeah, it was a big bull. Yeah. So, I mean, an elk, like, you'll only get, you know, maybe 300 yeah. and a half of them. Yeah. 250 mm -hmm. or so. It's a met And you're hunting, you know, this. these are Canadian moose, eastern, eastern Maine Canadian moose. Mm -hmm. They're measurably smaller than Alaska Yukon moose. Oh, they are? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, you know. A big Alaska Yukon moose is 15, 1800 pounds. The animal you're going to kill there is going to be like eight, 900, yeah, right. 950, something like that. What's your favorite thing to hunt these days? I mean, it's it's just about the hunt. I, it, it's where I go. I, I mean, I love white-tailed deer, wild turkey. I love waterfall hunting, love mountain hunting, love bear hunting. It's just all of it. Yeah, it's just being out there more than anything. Yeah, it's more... It's more um, the experience than what I'm hunting, right? Even, this is gonna sound silly, but even going on a squirrel hunt in, mm -hmm. you know, if I'm in the right place and, and uh, experiencing the right things, it, it's incredible. Yeah. What, uh, I'm sure you've been offered a million TV shows. Why did you never do one? I didn't wanna, um, I didn't wanna constrain the story down to 22 minutes and I didn't wanna deal with companies in the hunting industry. I didn't, I didn't want to have to, um, basically the model in the hunting industry is you purchase airtime. Yep. So basically you're buying yourself a TV show and then you have to, you put your films together or your pieces together, your content, and then you have to go to companies, bow companies, gun companies, mm -hmm. backpack companies, sell yourself, see if they'll give you a sponsorship. You record a commercial on your show or they give you a commercial to air and then, yep. um, you try to get these companies to cover your airtime and then you keep the rest. And that was just, I had no interest in, I just wanted to tell stories. And when did you, it. when did you start um, filming hunts? 20, oh, I, I mean, I filmed hunts all, like all through college. I filmed all those hunts. Oh, really? The handy cam. I get yeah, up in the, yeah, yeah, get up yeah, in the yeah. morning and. Oh, so you were doing it then? The, oh, hold the camera on me and, oh yeah. The little is, videotape ones? Yep, yep. little Sony, uh -huh. this day one. I saw a massive grizzly bear last night. The Northern lights were out. You know that type of stuff, and then um, uh, and I loved like I and so I started doing it basically so I could just rewatch my experience and sure. just take me back to that place. Yep. Yep. And um, and then we started professionally filming them in 2011. Is that when you started your production company? Yep, I went and worked with another gentleman in his production company, and uh, and I didn't like him. I didn't like who he was. I didn't like how he treated uh, the crew. Yep. And uh, and I didn't like how he treated the animals, and, and his ex his experiences when he was hunting were vastly different than mine. And he was somebody that was kind of sold to me as he's just like you, Donnie. It, you, like he burns for this stuff. Like you guys are gonna, and he's super talented with the camera. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna love him. Well, I didn't like him at all, <laughs> and um, and so I ended up um, basically. I, I say stealing, but I basically stole his employees and started a company. Gotcha. So both of the guys that work with me worked for him I see. in a, um, one was kind of like an internship and the other one, he was in the first, you know, he had worked there for like two months. Yeah. And so I said, hey, all I said to those guys, I said, hey, I'm leaving, I'm gonna start my own production company. And they both said, yep, yeah, just tell us where to, where, where, to, where, where are we going? Yep. Yeah. And so we, the three of us left him and it's been the three of us ever since and we've added three more. Wow. Um, and yeah, it's just, we have a full-time musician, uh, a couple of photographers and uh, editor and, and uh, yeah, it's just. What was the first big one you guys, the River, the River Divide? River's Divide, yeah. yeah. That was a great one. It was, yeah, it was, it was a cool project to put together, you know, and we had no idea what we were doing. I had no idea what we were doing. It was over, what, a couple of years? Two years, yeah. I hunted that deer. Yeah, I hunted, I hunted him um, for a couple of days and then ended up getting a shot at him, and and uh, that was the biggest deer I'd ever seen, really up to up to that point, and and to see him so close, like we were we were in a tree stand, but it was just like ten feet off the ground in this little oh, really? time. Yeah, because the tree, all the trees were just tiny, 
So I remember, like you, I mean, it was a small little wood lot. Little, little, yeah. Yeah, and so he just snuck through, and it was kind of raining, and and um, I don't have good hearing. Uh, <laughs> we learned that yesterday. Yeah, we learned that yesterday, <laughs> and um, and so we're. I was in this tree and, and uh, William Altman was filming me and he turned his head and he said, oh, and this deer had a nickname of Steve from yep. someone else named it. And, and uh, so he turned his head and he just said, Steve. And I said, what? And he said, Steve. And I said, what? And he said, Steve is right here. And so I just kind of peeked past him. I mean, he was at like five yards. Oh, really? Literally right there. And so seeing this, old, six and a half year old, absolutely, you know, just stunning animal yep. right there. And it was really bright colors that day because it was mm -hmm. overcast and rainy. And then he, you know, he walked out and you've seen the film. Mm -hmm. And then uh, after that it became this, this kind of conquest of where, where, and I, you know, I watch it now. you missed him. I, I missed him. Yep. Hi. Yeah. Missed him. Well, down and low, but yes, missed him. And, and then, and then you stuck him in the shoulder. In the shoulder. At 35 yards, because I was just having a, a, a meltdown. Yes. A, a mental and then Yeah, and then you went into the meltdown of, like, you basically can't shoot anymore. Yes. Yeah, full, full, I, I went down a road of full target panic. Yeah. Went down a road of not being able to execute a shot process at all. And then I had to... Had that ever happened before? No, no, this was, this was the beginning and the middle and, and, um... I actually thought about just walking away from my career, and I started doing no a lot of. No kidding. Oh yeah, and I started it doing a lot of research. Bad? Yes, and um, and I actually read about Fred Bear yep. that he he looked into shutting down bear archery because he had target panic so bad really? late in his career, and and um, so I just started reading every book I could on the human mind and mm -hmm. kind of what it goes through and Olympic shooters, and and I retrained myself to have zero target panic and how, and, how uh, so so. It was really weird. Okay. Um, if I would shoot my bow with no sight on it, okay. I had zero target panic. So I could come to full draw, yep. wrap my finger around the trigger, yep. put my arrow towards the target, right, because I don't have a sight, uh -huh. and then just pull through and, and have a very crisp, uninitiated release. Yeah. But if I put that sight on there yep. and that pin, that, that, that pin's relationship with the bullseye, mm -hmm. I was. I just tried to time everything, and, start, and so once I realized that aim, you know, uh, my friend Joel Turner, uh, I've worked with him a lot. He's my archery coach, mm -hmm. but and, and he always says aim, watch it to keep it. But then you kind of leave. You leave that process of aiming. It's you. You leave it alone. Once you find your aim, you keep that sight picture, and then you start articulating through your release. Right. So, I just retrained myself by shooting thousands of arrows, but I refused to shoot an arrow unless it was a surprise release. And so I, I bought a, a Carter Honey 2 release. It has no trigger. And so I just, it has a safety and I would draw, click the safety off and I would just pull, literally just pull through my release. And if the bow went off, then it went off. And if it didn't go off, then I would click the release back or the safety back on and let down. And I just did that for thousands of arrows until I was so comfortable with the recoil with the you know this explosive event that happens right next to your face I was so comfortable with it that I could start shooting again and it's now how I shoot everything that way now rifle pistol um, like I was just shooting targets the other night I was shooting uh, you know like a pie plate with a iron sight pistol at mm -hmm. like 65 70 yards the other night just because I'm just aiming, I find my aim, and then I'm just squeezing through my trigger and just poof, ding, and just, you know, and that's how I shoot everything now. And so then I met Joel Turner. Do you know who Joel? Uh, I've heard of him. Yeah, he runs Shot IQ. He basically was going through the same thing. He had target panic um, from when he was a little kid, and, and, um, and then he started looking in the human mind, and he really found the the back door if you will he really found what is the short circuit and so he built a training program called shot iq and he now ha he has an online course and he's my full-time archery coach he's a rifle coach he's you know and um and he's just unbelievable about teaching this process but i already had, i'd already retrained myself when i met him but just now working with him it's do you think if you would have dropped Steve that first time that it never would have happened? No, it would have it would have come. It was it, was it would have come. Yeah, because these big events 
I was letting my own mind own me, right? Let's, let's say you and I went out and shot right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there going, oh, my God, I'm shooting today with Jay Cutler. Like, God, I just want, I want to hit the bullseye. And so what I'm doing is I'm trying to take my pin, for anyone that doesn't understand this, I'm trying to kind of do this drive-by. I'm trying to, rather than just let my pin hover, mm -hmm. I have, the, you know, you have this idea that you're a man or a woman, whatever. Mm -hmm. And you have to keep your pin perfectly still on a bullseye. And then you... Which is almost impossible. It's, it is impossible. Yeah. And so really the secret is letting your subconscious mind aim for you. And so you, you make that wiggle as small as possible mm -hmm. and then you, you forget about it and you just keep that wiggle as small as possible and then you articulate your release back here, or pistol, rifle, whatever, and then you just, you know, I have this process. So I come to full draw, mm -hmm. I, I get my sight picture, I aim, and then this is what I do. I go, I don't say it out loud, but I go, and then when, you know, that some string just, just goes, pull, some point it just goes. Yeah. and like, I don't know what it's going to go off. Yeah. It just goes off and whoop, the arrow's in the middle and that little wobble, like my mind, essentially the subconscious knows when that crosshair is just coming back up to the bullseye yes. and that's, it just, it's like, I mean, there's a lot of things. Um, there's a book I read a long time ago. It's like the mental game of tennis or something like that, but it's basically the more you let your mind into these these type of things, the more it gets messed up. Mm -hmm. So like any anything, sports, um, anything you're basically doing, like your body knows mm -hmm. mentally how it to It wants do it. a shortcut. Yes. Yeah. And so Joel does this thing, it's really cool. Whenever he's teaching class, mm -hmm. he always goes, hey, who in here knows how to shoot a pistol? And there's always some guy that's like, yeah, I shoot a lot. Yeah. He's like, oh yeah, cool, get up here. And then he has, he's like, show me your stance. And yeah. he's a SWAT team instructor too. So, he, you know, he has this guy, he's like, ooh, good stance. Okay, good, good, <laughs> all right. So then he takes his hand, mm -hmm. and it's really funny. He's like, you're a good shooter, right? And the guy's like, yeah, I'm pretty good. And, you know, and, he, and he takes his hand while he's talking to the class and he just mm -hmm. keeps slapping me. And the guy's just sitting there going, tew, tew. he's like, yeah. And so this guy's shooting, right? And he's just shooting. Then he brings his hand and he misses the guy on purpose. And the guy goes, yeah. and he's like, oh, what are you doing there? Uh -huh. He's like, and that's what you're trying to get rid of. Yeah. You have to get rid of that because that push is your timing when the gun's gonna go off, your timing to push against that recoil. Yeah. And when you do that, you're pushing literally everything off. Mm -hmm. So if you can harness the calm of just keeping your iron sights or your crosshair mm -hmm. and you just keep it bouncing on the bullseye or on the animal, and then you just pull, pump, and it goes off. Like You start to really love that explosion. Like when I shoot a rifle, I went through. Um, you just accept the. Yeah, you just, oh, you welcome it. Yeah. Like, br br like the recoil. give it to me. Yeah. You know, like um, a lot of guys when they shoot a rifle, they're really holding on to that pistol grip. But I went and took a sniper course with um, Kalen Wojcik. Uh, he has a thing called Modern Sniper. Mm -hmm. He's an amazing shot. He's a scout sniper. I have a couple of buddies that are um, scout snipers, and so they made the introduction. But, you know, he, the prop, he was showing me proper technique to shoot rifles. and. So I'm keeping my thumb now off to the right side of, and, and my cheek is just buried onto the stock. And I just find that crosshair, you know, my cheek is just in there. I click the safety off and I'm literally just going through the trigger pull. You, you, keep, you say you keep your thumb off of it? Yeah, I keep my thumb off to the right. So instead you're, you're of, literally just one finger. Literally just. one finger and, the, you know, looking through, the, I see my sight picture and just, yeah. and, and like, and we're shooting like 1200 yards or whatever. Yeah. And so. He, he makes me like, we hike up in the mountains. He's holding onto my belt. I'm hanging over a cliff. He's like, okay, you see that little steel target down there? Yeah. And I'm like, let it fly. Uh, yeah. He's like, okay, now. So I'm same thing. I'm shooting straight down, trying to, he's trying to get the heights in my mind. So yeah. I'm just sitting there and just, boom, ding. And it's cool. Like uh, when we're shooting long distance, mm -hmm. you know, I'm just sitting there and gun goes off and I turn and look at him and he already has a huge smile on his face because he watched the bullet hit through a scope mm -hmm. and then and then we hear the ding, ding you know and so that that you know that whole event with Steve and it was funny because William you know when you film a hunt like this when you film a story you do things that are not natural so for instance if I'm gonna go shoot my bow um, I don't just go shoot my bow we find this is okay so we find a pretty place to shoot the bow and, and it's, I mean, who doesn't want to shoot their bow in a, in a pretty place anyway? So we find a, you know, we set the scene just like making a movie. We mm -hmm. set the scene, 
shooting a ball. And so then, you know, William's filming it from far, you know, medium, mm -hmm. and then he's going to film it close. Mm -hmm. So I come to full draw, and I have my trigger, and he's like, okay, Donnie, just wrap your finger around the trigger, and then just pull it as slow as possible. I'm like, okay. So I wrap my finger around the trigger, and I just go, as soon as my finger gets on the trigger, I, I shoot it. And he's like, oh, okay, no, don't shoot it. You know, so then I couldn't. I couldn't, Jay, and this was the beginning of it. I could not, as soon as my finger hit that trigger, it's gone. I, I instantly went into this rush mode, and, yeah. and then you know I retrained myself, and now I, everyone, everyone that shoots anything, pistol, rifle, bow, needs to contact Joel, needs to take his course. It, it, I think a lot, most people do not shoot weapons correctly or well, and most people, I think, suffer from this anxiety of shooting is particularly when they're around a group of guys. Oh gosh, yes, it's and, a lot of uh, pressure. It's a lot of pressure, and, but and, and it's a lot of pressure shooting on film too. Oh, tremendous! Because I mean, you're, I mean, you're, what you do, like you're basically hunting like one mature animal. Yes, and you get maybe, maybe once, maybe twice, maybe best case scenario. Yeah, and sometimes like you're sitting there, you know, like when we're hunting sheep. There's three, four of us. Yeah. We, everyone has 85 pounds on their back. Yeah. And we just climbed a 6,000, you know, we, we hiked 25 miles to get here and we just climbed 6,000 vertical feet. And there's the ram at 65 yards. And they're counting on you to make the shot. And, you know, and you're going to get one opportunity. And then if you mess up that shot, you have to turn around to the other two guys and be like, we have to head back. Sorry, boys. Yeah. And so it's just, it's a lot. But, you teach yourself this process, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, it's it, it's it's a really rewarding way to shoot. And now you're doing it with a traditional bow, which is even harder. Yeah, you just made it. You made it even hard. You went from gun compound, and now you're shooting a a, a stick with a, <laughs> a string, string on it. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's what made that's what makes it tricky with the trad bow. Um, mm -hmm. Like Joel always says, he's kind of a jackass about it, but mm -hmm. you know, I'll say, yeah, I can shoot out to about 30 yards. He's like, why does, why does distance matter? Well, distance matters because everything has to be perfect and you have to know your aiming point out to these certain distances. Sure. And if anything is wrong, um, your arrow is off too much to take an animal's life. And so, you know, you just have to, but it, like, for instance, right now for me, 30 yards and under, it's like every time I shoot, the arrow lands in the kill zone. Aside from if I have, you know, some sort of, you know, like a, just a horrible shot, like, mm -hmm. you know, something goes wrong or whatever. But. Uncut with Jay Cutler is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening to me talk, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy and you can save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save over $700 on average. And auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 27 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive casualty insurance companies and affiliates. National annual average insurance savings by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2020 and May 2021. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. I talked to, um, you know, uh, Cam, Cam Haynes, mm -hmm. like he's, he was, he shoots out to like 300. Mm -hmm. It's absurd. Yeah. Like literally absurd. Yeah. And he just lets his, like it, to, to people, it, it looks like Cam shooting 300 yards, but to Cam, he's just letting his pin bounce at a different, you know, like, so he's, so the target's there and he knows that if he aims at the top of this telephone pole, his mm -hmm. arrow's gonna be about there at 300 yards. Mm -hmm. So he just lets his pin, he's not aiming at 300 yards, he just lets his pin bounce around at the top of the telephone pole and yep. does his release and lo and behold, there it is in the balloon at 300 it's, yards. That's crazy. Now the stuff that I don't understand and I really don't is like the guys that have that um, and I don't even know what it is. I guess it's just maybe timing or whatever, but like the guys that can shoot through like the center of lifesavers or like yeah. they can throw a dime and shoot a dime out of the air. Like I can throw a dime up and shoot close to the dime every time, but hitting the dime every time, hitting no. an aspirin every time, like these trick shooters, I don't know how they do that. I don't either. Yeah. That's different. 
Yeah. I, and I saw I saw a girl the other day shooting. Um, she did a handstand, and she was holding her bow with, with her feet. With her feet. Yeah. And she shot through like a little tiny ring at thirty yards and just absolutely smoked. Like, how you do that? I'm. No, I mean, I don't even. She does has. She doesn't even have a sight picture. You know, so I don't know how they do that. I don't either. Yeah, and then like the Dude Perfect guys, I got to meet the guys from Dude Perfect, and um, like my boys are in, think they're in love with those guys. Oh, and so I, I met Tyler. Yep. And I asked. They my, hunt. Oh, a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. how I met them. Is gotcha. I met them through uh, True Velocity, mm -hmm. and so we were down there filming a bunch of military guys and shooting a bunch of test mm -hmm. um, ammunition, and Tyler is uh, one of he's he's uh, an investor in True Velocity, and so gotcha. he came out to like check stuff out and. So I asked him, and he gave me a little bit of the secret sauce. And uh, so I was like, come on, tell me, how do you guys do this? And they, What do they have, like a thousand takes? Yeah, they have a thousand takes, but yeah. that's, but think about it. That's the amazing part, because they are willing to look into the camera a thousand times and be like, this is the grocery cart shot. And, oh, nope. This is the grocery card shot. Oh yes. Oh, nope. Keep doing and, it. And they and with the same enthusiasm uh -huh. because when they make it, that's the cut. That's the one. Now he said, you know, he told me he's like, you know, there's sometimes where they'll like they'll blindfold, like walk out onto a basketball court and you know hook shot and it goes it in the in. first time. Yeah. But they said sometimes it takes a thousand takes. Yeah. Yeah. They're coming to Nashville, um, I think, in July, and uh, we, my boys are dying to go. So. And they're, and they're such they're good dudes i've only met the one guy but they just seem like yeah. they give you the shirt off their back and yeah yeah i mean it's amazing what they've done <laughs> their brand like it's absurd <laughs> yeah i mean doing you know jackass stuff with nerf guns and, yeah. and building it into and it's just such good uh it's such good content yeah yeah for, stuff. i mean they're, they, they're based i mean they're doing a stadium tour now yeah I mean, they're going to bridgestone yeah and it's sold out yeah I mean, it's amazing. And doing it live. And doing it live. Yeah. Which I don't know how they're going to pull this off, but it's <laughs> be interesting. No, I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's some tensions around that, but oh, yeah, yeah, it's, um. So what do you, uh, what, uh, what hunts do you have coming up? Um, Maine moose. Um, I did it last year and we filmed, um, and I just wanted, I just want more body in that work, right? Like some of our films, like the other side, our bear film, yep. we filmed that over seven years and all over Alaska, British Columbia, and, and um, seven years. Seven years, yeah. What's the longest you've been up there before? Uh, slept in a tent, yeah. five and a half months. <laughs> Why? Uh, well, that was doing research. That I was studying salmon for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. But uh, longest hunt I've done, staying in a tent, is thirty some days. And it was incredible, and it was. I mean, you you said that the alone people contact you all the time. Do you oh, think yeah. you, you think you could win that show? Um, Probably I do, right. I do. Yeah. yeah. I, I, my my. I mean, oh yeah. You kill one animal and you're pretty much you're good to go. Kind of. It's it's not nearly as easy as people think. The the biggest issue that I would have is I don't. I'd have to learn how to build a shelter with a fireplace. I've never done that. I don't know how to do that. I would have to look into a way to build a stone fireplace and build my shelter around it so that my shelter wouldn't burn. Burn down. But yet I could burn. Heat and then yeah, shooting the recurve, um, you know, setting snares, shooting the recurve, fishing. Like if you are in an area with animals, you know, they might drop you in an area where There's you don't see anything. Yeah, and you run out of food. Like the jig's up, man. It's over. Yeah, you have 30 days without food, and you're going to be in, you know, maybe 45, but you're going to be in rough shape. Yeah. And um, but yeah, if I could, if I got my shelter right and killed even a, you know. If there's animals there, like I'm, I'm winning. Yeah, yeah, because I'll just l literally. And you have no problem being alone and being out zero. There. Yeah, zero, and not none of that. Nothing. The only thing that scares me when I'm out there alone is weather. That's the only thing that, like, when a big storm blows in, that's the what, what gets my hackles up. And when the tent is, you know, like, we had a, we had a, we set a tent up. It, it seems I'll learn. But, but I haven't learned yet. Like, we'll land in a, with a little airplane on a mountaintop, pick out a beautiful place, like, mm -hmm. okay, caribou are coming through here, moose hunting or whatever. And, okay, let's set the tent up here. Be Bluebird day, beautiful. Okay, this hillside will protect us from, you know, three quarters of the directions. No, always blows 70, the <laughs> one direction, and always wake up in the middle of the night. Teepee is literally, because we, we sleep in a floorless teepee. Mm -hmm. 
wall is completely caved in, metal rod is bending, burning through, like literally, you know, augering down through rock and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then, you know, we'll have to move down below and, and, uh, figure it out. Yeah. And just, yeah, it's just, but weather is, yeah. I mean, if, if you had animals or caught fish, snared, snared snowshoe hares or whatever mm -hmm. it is, wherever you are, arrow to moose, musk ox, black bears, it's what some of these people like, yeah. But, you're good. Good to go. Yep. Um, I also saw a thing like where you were surrounded by wolves mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. I've done that a couple of times. Yeah, that's what you said. It's incredible. Yeah. I, I say this, you know, I said it. Were on you worried at all? Um, no. No. Um, what For are, those watching, Donnie's got a shot where like he's basically just, I mean, you were just on the kind of on the ground and surrounded by wolves. Yeah. So we were stalking a bull moose mm -hmm. and so were they. And so we bumped into each other. And um, so I saw something white through the alders. And there's no trees where we are. It's mm -hmm. just like 10 foot tall brush. Mm -hmm. So I see something white. And, and uh, so I stop. It's me, um, Chris Kirkaby, and William Altman. And I stopped and I was like, hey, I see the moose. I thought it was his paddle that I could see. And so I leaned out around this alder and I looked. And it was a, it was a uh, not white, but a very light gray wolf. And she was just sitting there, just proper, like a dog, just sitting there looking at me. I was like, oh, hey, it's a wolf. And so I said, William, you know, wildlife footage is everything. Mm -hmm. right? So I said, William, sneak around this. And, you know, she's only 20 yards away. I said, sneak over there and see if she'll let you film her. Mm -hmm. So he sneaks around and, and um, it's, really, it's kind of like, it reminded me of um, Jurassic Park with the, uh, with the uh, velociraptors mm -hmm. where, you know, the one lets you see. Yeah. And so we're staring at her and filming her and then all of a sudden, she stands up and walks away, and he's like, oh, that was so cool, you know, she was right there, and then all of a sudden, there's one right here, and so, it's funny, because the three of us were like, oh, how'd she get there so fast? <laughs> you know, and then, and then, oh, no, she's back, and yeah. here's this one, and there's two, and it's really haunting how they do it, but you just, it's almost like a, uh, like a uh, horror film. You look at the alders, and then you just see their golden eyes, like, they're not moving, they're hunting, yeah. right? They're not necessarily hunting us, but they're just, you see them and they're like, oh, oh, there's one, oh, there's one. And, uh, and then they started coming in and, and um, they're communicating with one another. They're going, and they come in right around us. I mean, they're four or five yards. And, um, and Chris Kirkby, he's a really good photographer. He's, free, he's freaking out. And he, he swore, he doesn't swear that much, and he swore at me. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, you know, we don't have a gun. Yeah. You know, we just have a boat. And he said, and he looked at me, and, he, and he's looking all around, and he's like, why aren't you freaking out? Yeah. I said, oh, I said, hey, we're fine. Because I was looking at the wolves, I wasn't looking at them. I said, hey, man, I said, Chris, we're fine. He's like, why, why aren't you knocking an arrow? Like, mm -hmm. I said, hey, man, I said, calm down. Like, we're totally fine. Yeah. Like, these, they're just checking us out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, uh, and then, you know, they checked us out and they moved off. We saw them again um, later that day. We kind of bumped into each other again. But years before that, um, I was up there doing research when I was sleeping in the tent for five months. And I had a group of wolves move into my research camp because I have gear on the river um, for working on salmon. Mm -hmm. And so after the salmon would spawn, their carcasses would come down and hang up on the gear. So the wolves were feeding on the dead fish. And so I ended up spending about two months with a small pack for four or five wolves really and they were there ever i mean they would and i did i i'm not proud to admit this but i tried to feed them a few mm -hmm. times salmon like mm -hmm. i tried they would never take it from my hand mm -hmm. they would get like four or five yards away you try to like dance as wolf with it yeah and um <laughs> and then Costner. it started with one female mm -hmm. and it was really cool because i would howl at her she would howl back at me and then um we just had a really cool engagement, and, and uh, I'd go fly fishing. She'd kind of come with me. Really? And uh, yeah, I was telling this to Rogan, and he, I go, yeah, Joe, she would, she would walk like two feet behind me, and, and he's, you know, so matter of fact, mm -hmm. he's at the table, and he's like, Donnie, one foot, two foot, and I go, okay, Joe, maybe a foot and a half, and he's like, come on, and I'm like, <laughs> she literally would walk right behind me, you know, and it was funny because when, um, so your pet dog. When she would walk behind me, if I didn't make eye contact, she would just kind of like, she'd sniff the air. She'd walk behind me and just go. But if I made eye contact, she would snarl. Really? She would show her teeth. And so I'm sure she was just posturing. Like if I yeah. made eye contact, she's like, hey, like, we're not friends here. Yeah. Yeah, don't touch me. Yeah. 
that if you come at me, you're, you know. We're, it's on. It's on, yeah. yeah. So, and then all of a sudden then there was another wolf. And then um, I had a wolf howling on, um, we would set up these planks in the research camp so that we weren't walking on the tundra because the, your footprints will impact the tundra for hundreds of years by just stepping on it. Really? Yeah, and so we would build these planks to walk on. So it'd be a log, like a Lincoln log, Lincoln yeah. log and a two by four. And so we just like balance beam to all the different, like to the research tent, to the kitchen, to all these different things. And so I have a balance beam that goes to my tent and then my tent is on this little platform of, of boards and uh, that raises up above the tundra. And so one night, a wolf howled sitting on my platform and it woke me from a dead sleep and I grabbed my shotgun and I put one in the chamber and I was just sitting there kind of panting like something woke me up, something right here. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I unzipped my vestibule a little bit and I looked out and I could see this massive wolf sitting right there on the platform and I thought it was her. But then when I saw the size of this dog, I was like, oh, that's not her. Like, yeah. this is a much larger animal than she was. Mm -hmm. And um, and that was, so the first time I saw her, I saw her for two or three days. Then he showed up. And then there, I think there was two others, maybe three others. I, I never saw all of them at once. Yeah. So I had to kind of look at their markings. And then, um, and then the other thing that happened that was really uncommon in, I mean, in, in my life, is I would go on long hikes for exercise and um, they would freaking go with me sometimes. Really? So they'd stay out like 100, 200 yards, mm -hmm. but they would literally flank me and like they would just go on this giant walkabout too and, and you know, and then, you know, they would disappear and then I wouldn't see them for two days and then they'd show up again and, yeah. I mean, I guess with the amount of time you've spent out there, it's, that's not, what it that, is. it's not that. No, that's what it is. Yeah. It's just, when, when and that's the thing, like when I go on these 30 day hunts, that's mm -hmm. the thing, it's like, you get there and the bugs are bad, the leaves are all green, the grass is tall and green, and in 30 days, you're leaving and everything's frozen, the leaves have already went through their full transition of color and have yeah. fallen off. Yeah. The moose have went through having dark chocolate velvet on their antlers to stark white antlers and going through the whole breeding season. It's mm -hmm. just, when you're in the Arctic, 30 days is fall. Really? In 30 days, you're experiencing all of fall from summer to winter. To here. winter. Yeah in 30 days. So if you get there September 1st, which I've done, yeah. and then you leave October 1st, I mean, you're showing up and probably hunting in a t-shirt or a light rain jacket, and you're leaving uh, potentially in a blizzard. Really? Yep. That fast? That fast, 30 days. Jeez. Yep. That's wild. It's crazy. It really yeah. is. Yeah. All right, um, where can people find you? DonnieVincent.com is, um, you know, I, I, I need to be better about <laughs> getting myself out there. I need to be better about social. Uh -huh. I'm, yeah, I, I've. You got I'm, a lot of cool stuff to offer. You got to get better at it. I do. I, I kind of, I'm, I'm, it's oddly enough, I'm a private person. Yeah. And um, I do things every day that I think, like right now, I'm sitting here with Jay Cutler in your studio. And, yeah. you know, I don't have any photographs of this. and But, you know, it'd be really interesting to tell my audience that I did this today. And, yeah. and um, yeah, I just need to get better at it. Yeah. I, I wish I could just, um, you know, communicate and just get it done. But it's, it's, I enjoy the writing. I love the writing. You're an incredible writer. I appreciate that. But I, I um, yeah, I just need to get better at sharing my life with, with, um, with, with people. And, yeah. and um, yeah, and I, yeah, there's, there's gear that I want to build. There's, um, you know, I'd love to take new people hunting and, mm. and uh, new experiences. And yeah, I just, I'm, I'm very easily entertained by, by being outside. It's an amazing world out there. It is, yeah. All right, um, DonnieVincent.com. You can find Donnie on Instagram. Um, he's got f a bunch of cool films. I, I, I'm, you got a bunch of stuff coming out. Bunch of stuff coming out. Um, client work starts to kind of take over, but I just hired a second editor, so we're going to start really um, buckling down on films. Pushing some stuff out. And I probably have five or six um, films complete right now that we just have to build, and I have to write, and we have to come out. I'm excited that let's let's get writing. Let's get them out there. Yeah, I, yeah. we need some new we need some new stuff. We're gonna do. do that. Yeah, I I want I would love to have a body of work. Like by the time I don't know when I'm gonna die, but it's probably not going to be of old age. But I'd love to have a body of work that people can enjoy after. I mean, you you have a body. I mean, you just keep doing it. Yeah, and we'll keep after it. Cool. Um, 
I appreciate it. I appreciate it very fun. much. This is a, a very uncommon um, opportunity for me to sit down and speak with a gentleman like you. And, uh, and uh, it's you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it is not lost on me. It's definitely been my pleasure. Oh, no, it's mine. Um, check out Donnie. I mean, even if you're not a, a hunter or anything, his, uh, his work um, will probably open your eyes, inspire you a little bit. Um, it's, it's actually, it's, it's art. It's true art. And it's uh, not many people do it the way he does it, especially in the in the hunting industry. So um, check him out, and uh, you'll be happy you did. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Cool.